Okay, thank you. It's absolutely fantastic to see so many people here this evening. And I'm delighted to welcome you to Leeds Art Gallery. I'm Sarah Brown, curator of programme here. And we are, this is the first of a series of Tuesday talks that we are working with Leeds Beckett University, have supported us to organise. And my colleague Jane Boyru has worked with Marion and Harold to put together. And I want to say thank you very much. And I also want to say thank you to Lydia and Ryan, who have very kindly agreed to take valuable time out, because as many of you know, we aren't open yet. We open on Friday. So I want to thank Lydia and Ryan, who have been working, installing the show, which is not yet done. So, thank you. And I'm going to introduce Lydia Yi, who is the curator of Bridge Art Show 8 with Anna Collin and also Chief Curator at Whitechapel Art Gallery, and artist Ryan Gander, who has been working on new work for the Bichard Show, um, and not yet finished, but will be. Um, and I think you're going to talk in conversation for about 30, 40 minutes? 30 minutes? And then there will be an opportunity for questions? Um, yeah. We ask that you send your questions by a text to this number up here. This is the artist's second phone. So, um, we'll, I think Ryan will choose a selection of them at the end of the last 20 minutes or so. Okay, that saves chairing. Brilliant. And then maybe that also saves long-winded uh, questions. Um, but I think um, we should start first by may maybe talking a little bit about um, Ryan's current exhibition that just opened at Lucian Gallery in London. So we're going to start off, um, I with Ryan's current exhibition called Fieldwork at Listen Gallery. And it's a good opportunity to talk about something that maybe um, hasn't been kind of talked about so much since it's a brand new work. Um, so let's start with um, the uh, project itself called Fieldwork. Um, maybe we can put this on a rotation and you can see images from the show and the slide will come up again so if you need to catch the number you'll see it again. Um, but the piece called Fieldwork is a series of objects on a conveyor belt. You take a seat in a broyer chair next to a broyer, is it an actual broyer chair? Well, rather than a fake one. Yes. I wanted a fake one, but the, everyone in the studio said that I couldn't use one. Okay. So we got a real one. And a nesting table. Um, and you look through an aperture in the wall and you see a series of objects passing in front of you, maybe not unlike a slideshow. Um, so, Ryan, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this piece, um, the ideas behind it. Um, each object has a story, and how did you choose the objects? And it's also kind of a co continuation of a project you did a few years ago. Yeah. Um, co collections. In, in the art world, there's lots of collections, private collections, and museum collections and public collections. And it occurred to me, so this is, the, this is what we were talking about. So this is a glass window that's about a metre square, and there's a conveyor belt. So the gallery is really big, but you don't see much of the gallery because I built a wall, you just have a tiny space at the front, and then these things just go past you, which is a bit like your, you young people's scroll culture, like that. Um, so as soon as you get used to something, you move on to the next thing. Not that I'm blaming you for that. Um, and also, when we look at exhibitions, we wander around them and we navigate them and we choose our own tempo and our own direction <coughs> and our own order to things. And I quite like the idea that I'd made a collection that navigated you, the spectator. So you would sit there slightly lazily and these things would go past you at a tempo that was controlled. So some things you're not interested in but you can't speed them up and some things you want to see more of but they go too fast. Like life. Um, the book in some ways maybe slows you down a bit. There's a book on the Breuer nesting table um, and it has uh, stories or texts about each of the objects. Yes, yeah, so in the collection, this collection, there's... I'm just going to pause it on one. <coughs> there. 
So the collection is 66 objects and it's called, the first 33 objects are called Fieldwork 2015 and the second 33 are called Fieldwork 2016. So it's a collection split into two halves. And the book, the green book on the table is a book I wrote where each object has an uh, essay or text written about it. It's, my wife calls it amateur philosophy, and Phil, because I'm crap at writing. And I do it in the car on a dictaphone when I'm driving between Suffolk and London. And then the poor intern at work has to type it up with me shouting at other drivers along the way. And which gives it this weird sort of conversational tone. But I mean, yeah, the, the texts are all different approaches. So one is, uh, I've actually got the book, but it's a bit boring showing a book on a screen in it. You're not gonna read it. Um, so one of them is a script which is a play between two pigeons, a Scouse pigeon and a London pigeon. And they discuss the merits of uh, Victorian buildings to modernist buildings for taking off and landing. And then another one is the accounts for the production of the work, which is a series of money boxes. This one that you can see here, my six-year-old daughter, we live by the sea and we go to the beach a lot and it's a stone beach and she picked a load of pebbles up and painted them with powder paint. When we got home, she realised that there was the same amount of pebbles as letters in the alphabet. And I tried to explain to her that letters are just shapes and they could be any shape and you could swap them around. It's just that everyone agrees on them and I was trying to explain what language is. Um, and she asked if we could make a typeface, which is an alphabet, she said, out of stones. So we produced this, <coughs> this alphabet that's called Set in Stone. And this is a book that I republished, which is the infamous um, self-help book called How to Win Friends and Influence People, but reset in stone, uh, with her alphabet around it. So all these things have different reasons for existing. Some of them are borrowed, some of them are artworks I've bought, some are things that I've made, some are things that prop companies have made. Um, but they're all, in a way, phenomenal to me. And you asked about choosing them. Yes, I'd and also... Chosen because there was, uh, there was a list of about 800 and I just narrowed it down to a good variety. So I wanted it so when these objects go past you, you don't find similarities between them, which is ridiculous because it's the <coughs> human brain always makes associations between two things, which was like part of the challenge in life. So um, one of the themes that runs through the British Art Show 8 is um, objects and, and the stories behind them. I was wondering in, in your work, in this piece in particular, what comes first, the object or the story? Story. Story. The so object's the, just like a, a, a byproduct. Exhaust, it's like the exhaust fumes, the object, or a receipt for the transaction. It's just the thing that's left over, the fallout of the story, really. Because <coughs> the story exists without the thing, you just need the thing as a sort of carrier so other people can see it. Because if I didn't have a thing, you lot wouldn't see it and then they wouldn't have an excuse to tell you the story. <laughs> and also, by giving you the, this off-cut, then you <coughs> make up your own stories about it. That's the plan, anyway. Don't so it doesn't so any like story that. could be illustrated by a range of objects, or is it important that two dead pigeons tell the story about the pigeons and the modernist buildings. Well, if you see two dead pigeons, you might think of hunting, or you might think of urban architecture, or you might think of rats with wings. There's lots of trajectories you could go in. But, I mean, it's important to keep it open enough that there are trajectories, otherwise it wouldn't be art. It'd just be me telling you something. Um, Biography also seems to be a thread that runs through um, fieldwork, um, the exhibition. Um, there's <coughs> things like, uh, a, a, um, I think it's a mirror with paint swatches on it, um, where you've uh, tried to match the color of the sky every day for a whole year um, in Suffolk where you live. Or are all those stones, for example, from a beach, a local beach? Then, yeah. <coughs> um, and, and there's a chess work? set that my dad made as well in the, in the show. So biography and the kind of stories around your personal life. I don't, I don't like work like that. It's funny. 
I hate work that was about the artist's life. I find it really twee and sickly. And then I make it, I don't know why, massive contradiction. Um, <coughs> it's less to do with biography and it's more to do with like a sort of revisiting possibilities for your life because I'm nearly 40. It's because I'm having a midlife crisis. Um, because I'm 40 next year, I keep thinking that, you know that thing, if I'd made that decision then, I would have been here or would have been there, or keep doing that. So there's a lot of work that's about that. What if scenarios, <coughs> parapossible <coughs> trajectories, it's all back to the future. And sometimes... And having kids, sorry. <coughs> yeah. having, and kids having parents. You. And having parents, who are, yeah. So your father um, often crops up in works or references to him. Yeah. Um, he was an engineer at Bedford Trucks. Vauxhall, yeah. Vauxhall. And, and he made trucks. He did well, trucks. yeah, for a bit. He did at the Vauxhall in Ellsmere Port's home of the Astra. And they don't cheat on emissions. He was really annoyed the other day about the Volkswagen thing. He sat in the garden with me having a drink quite late. And he said, if we bloody cheated, we'd be rich as well. It's really annoying. Man. Sorry. No, I was just wondering about, as an engineer, did that have an influence on your decision to become an artist? Or, I mean, maybe he was almost like an inventor. He, he's, cut, he's a really romantic man, super romantic. And everything he thinks is an idealized view. He's like, and he's really sociable. And he always wanted to be an artist, I think. Well, then he always wanted to be an artist. And, uh, and he did engineering, because needs must, and you know, you have to do things that not everyone gets to choose. And I think secretly, this is being videoed for the internet, so you'll probably watch it. I think secretly, uh, maybe he likes what I do because he would have liked to have done it. And so he helps me a lot. So all the lamps that I make, he actually makes. So we sit together in my studio in Suffolk and he burns his fingers with a soldering iron and shouts, shit, a lot. And then I make him a cup of tea. It's a great practice working with your dad. It's a really nice way to work. Does he actually come to the studio? Yeah, 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 yeah he helps me a lot. And he made uh, one of the things, I don't know if there's a picture, but one of the objects on the conveyor belt is a chess set that he told me that when he worked on the Bedford truck, this is what you were angling at, wasn't it, the Bedford truck? Yes. Thing? Yeah. Um, he told me that there was, it's probably not here, it's not here. He told me that there was two pieces that were under the Bedford truck that looked like a king and a queen, a man and a woman, female, male form. And he always thought that they'd make beautiful sculptures. And he stole some from Vauxhall Motors and he kept them in the garage for years and years. And one day he said he would, he, with the idea that one day he would mount them on a block of oak and varnish it and stick them on the mantel, please. And this would be an artwork. And he threw them away when he moved. And he was telling me one night in the pub, and it gave me this idea to make a complete chess set from pieces of a car, that, a van that's no longer in existence, but re engineered and re milled, but through a sort of, well, through emails and drawings, he dealt with the people who made them. So we made this chess set, which is it's a shame that I have a photo because it's. Not all my work looks very good, but that looks quite good. And you turned that into a public sculpture? And it's a public sculpture as well outside uh, Etihad, Man City, Grand. Um, I'm also curious about your studio practice. You keep a studio both in Suffolk and one in London. How does the division of labor work between those two studios? Is one more a research-based uh, place and is the other more about kind of fabrication and... Uh, one's full of people who are frantically trying to keep up with themselves and the other one's me and my dad drinking tea. Yeah, because, well, one's like an office, one in London, and you can't really... We do a bit there, but not a lot, and most things are made outside or planned there and then fabricated elsewhere. So, well, you know, a book it has to be fabricated somewhere because we don't have a printing press. So, I mean, it always sounds bad, doesn't it, when you say you make everything's outsourced? No? 
We've got a cutting mat. <laughs> and we've got a packing bench. And then in Suffolk is like, a, so that's in the railway arch in, um, on Kingsland Road. Uh, and it's like a big office. And there's a little store in there, and all our storage is somewhere else. And then there's a studio in Suffolk that I rent that's uh, on an industrial estate. And it's between a dog food factory and a nuclear power station. And it's not that pretty. Um, but it's really nice. Because you can come and go. And it's, yeah. One of the works in the exhibition is a wallpaper that has photographs, I think, taken in off the studio walls that yeah. are lined with ideas. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, how you generate all those ideas and the idea of posting them up on the wall? Mm -hmm. Is that a way to think about them? Is it an archive? Is, um, how do you it's because it? that front, your RAM, is that right? Random access memory. The front bit of your brain. I don't know if it's physically at the front, but the bit that's always active. At least I'm not explaining this very well, am I? There's old stuff and new stuff. <laughs> no, memories and then all the stuff that you keep at the front that you need to get out. I have to keep in front of my eyes because it doesn't stay in the front bit because the front bit's not big enough to keep everything in it. Does that make sense? Because I can remember stuff if I really try, but uh, all the stuff that has to be at the front is that has to be visually there. Otherwise, I won't see it all at once. I just see little bits of it. So, and I do it in a couple of ways. I do it with photographs in index files, and I do it with words on walls. But they just get bit, they get some more than I can manage to make. So two come down and fifty go up, and then you need a bigger studio. Is there a way of sorting or prioritizing which ones are more likely to become <coughs> artworks, or want other ones on the back burner? How do you kind of you know decide what? what bubbles up to the top? That's a hard question. I don't know, it's always different. <coughs> and it's not really that well calculated. It's kind of... Sometimes <coughs> I end up not doing the ones that are too high to reach to get down. So it's not always calculated. There's other reasons for doing something or not doing something. Like having the money to do it, or having someone to invite you to a space to do it, or having the right type of space to do it, or... <coughs> Yeah, there's so many factors that it's like, uh, I don't wake up and say, oh goody, what can I make? I just choose the thing I want to make. Uh, there's so many other factors that control what I make. Mm -hmm. But how does it not become, I don't know, like um, just hundreds of ideas and how do you, how do you kind of keep track of them? Um, I don't <coughs> really keep track of them. I, I sort of lose, get lost in them and then come back up. When it sounds a bit mad, doesn't it? Does it sound mad? It sounds like I'm exaggerating. They're literally up on the walls in the gallery, um, and you'll see them. And I, I'm, I wonder if you think, or would somebody steal those ideas, because you've put them <coughs> out there, and you haven't realized all of them. Uh, does it? What are those ideas? I, I guess they would do it in a different way than you. <coughs> but I mean, like, if you think about all the ideas in the world, mm -hmm. They're not, that, they're not even that good. And what about... You can have them if you want them. <laughs> not bothered. You also sometimes make work with under an, the, an artistic alter ego or, or pseudonyms. Yeah, yeah, there's a few. That's like an excuse to make more work. Because it's not very... Um, To be honest, the art world doesn't like you making a lot of work. It's kind of bad to make lots of work for getting paid. So I have to find ways, because I have this kind of idea diarrhea thing. I have to find ways of getting more out without it looking like I get more out, so that I can make it. So I make things and then I hide them or destroy them, or just photograph them, but never, no one really sees them. And then the reason I started making collections is because I can get 66 works out into one work. So I can rid myself of 66 ideas just with one work. And then also the works that are here, it's kind of like uh, exhaustive because it, it makes, it's kind of liberating to get these things that I want to 
think about or thought too much about. And then the characters are like that as well. Because it means that I can make work by other people. And also style's a big problem. I don't like really having st a style or, or such. And the nice thing is, but you need a style in a way, because otherwise nobody knows who you are, and then you don't get paid. You need to get, that sounds really greedy, but you do need to get paid so that you can make the next thing, otherwise you wouldn't do that, you'd be doing something else. Um, so yeah, and it means that I can make, there's a character called Santo Stern, who's a, like a terrible artist, and I make work by him, and that's kind of liberating, because it means that I can make, like, really gaudy neon with like leopard skin curtains and stuff and then there's a really good one called Aston Ernest and he's an anagram of Santo Stern and he's like the best artist so he's like way better than me which was was a sort of challenge to make work better than I could make work so which is impossible isn't it because you're always you you can only do as well as you can do you can't be better than you can do so there's these two, they're nemesis of each other. Uh, and then there's Vivi Enkyo, she's a Japanese, she's an old lady now. Abe Freya, he's uh, Wallonian, he's actually dead. Um, there's loads of them. And they come, they come and go, I make work by them, but actually I just did a show in the summer in Copenhagen that was <coughs> by Spencer Anthony, who was the first one that I made. He just had like, he lives in St. Ives. He's about 67, 68. Um, and he, I just did a show by him, which is good to do. Um, although you say style is important, you also have said that you hate seeing something and knowing who it's made by. How do you yeah. reconcile those? Kind of That's why I'm doing it. I don't know. I'm trying to work it out. Uh, can you give an example, maybe, of... Of who? Of something, yeah, that you, I don't know, would dislike because you recognise it immediately, or...? Yeah, but I don't know if I should, because I'll get in trouble. Okay. <laughs> um, but everyone knows it. You know, you look at something, you go, oh, that's whoever. And that, oh, that's... Didn't you make a piece with all these uh, <coughs> silver objects? all kind of welded together or...? Yeah, it really, it's called really shiny things that don't mean anything. And it's a big shiny ball, made of lots of shiny things that don't mean anything. It's vaguely familiar. I wouldn't, does it? Who does it look like? I don't remember. I've seen some public sculpture that looks like that. Uh, I could, if it wasn't being on the internet, I could tell you loads of stuff now. But I can't. So maybe we'll wait till the camera's When the camera's off, I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> um, I'm going to put this, uh, this... I don't know how I'll be able to find it. This is the... This is the problem of being ill-prepared, I guess. Oh, oh, God. It's come to this, isn't it? Uh, that one. It's okay, people can look it up. Yeah, there you go. That's a detail, oh no, it's a scarf. Anyway, you'll have to look it up because it could take me hours to look for it. So Ryan, you make something like, <coughs> by my guess, maybe a work a week or more? Is that fair uh, to say? Uh, probably more, a little bit more than one a week. Maybe one every five days. And how do you maintain this pace and do you ever, are you sad to see some of the works go into the world or do you ever keep anything back for yourself? Um, it's a, to be really honest and blunt about it, it's a tightrope between um, money being a great enabler and bankruptcy constantly. That's it, that's a close up of it. Um, so there's some things that you, I might do that I know might pay for other things that I know won't make any money. And at the end of the day, everyone needs pay. You know, you've got a mortgage and you've got to pay people. And, and it's very expensive making art. Uh, yeah. So it's like, I kind of do trade-offs now and again, where if I want to make like uh, uh, a bill, then I'd have to save up my tokens, my art tokens, to be able to make it. 
or a radio play, because no one's run a radio play. Not even a museum would run a radio play, would they? Maybe occasionally the BBC would commission one every decade or so. Yeah, pay very well the BBC. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever work to brief? I mean, I know yeah. you often... I do, so I do other things as well. I do like some... Shoes, cocktails... Consultancy work, but yeah, uh, like companies, property companies and stuff. Because and, essentially making art is just about processing ideas very quickly and exploring different possibilities of lots of ideas which is and it sounds like it's not like a, it's not like a genius subject but if you know how to to do that it is like a skill that you learn and you can grow you can you know you can become good at and there's so there is a whole industry of people who are just who think for people who don't have time to think so I do some of that and I do trainers for uh, Adidas, and I have a clothes label in Japan. <coughs> and, um, what else do I do? I've got a company that makes a kitchen sink. Um, so I'll try and get this out. Of, uh, do you consider all of them art, or no? No, only the art. Like the, so that would be art. That's art. That's art. That's all, that's all. Uh, that's not art, the clothes. That's a commission. Mm -hmm. So that's, I make these commissions for people. You know, you have a sitting and people sit there and you paint them. So I make an artwork that's a conceptual artwork that's, someone pays me half the money. I send them a book that I've made. They fill the book in and they have to send me flowers and postcards and choose a perfume and it takes six months to fill it in, they send it back to me and then I read it and then I produce an artwork that conceptually embodies my um, interpretation of their character from what I read in the book. So that's a commission, art, art, that's a clothing. That's, um, it's a mathematical symbol that says, I can't remember now, it's so long ago, something like, nothing is the same as nothing. Thing. But it's made from uh, Nigel Kennedy's electric violins, and he was the South African guy that shot his wife, allegedly. The story is his false leg. Low goes him. That's the Nokia ringtone, but in xylophone keys on top of an empty frame. That's, this is an advert for itself. It's a video of a girl jumping on a bed, and this is a CNN identity. And it gives all the information about the work, and it's just looped. Uh, that's me, my arm holding a sculpture of Brunel uh, before it's invested. You know when you make a bronze, you have this, and then you, they, they fill it with bronze, essentially. So it's called an investment. So all the public commissions for public artworks that I don't win, which is probably about 95% of them, uh, which isn't very good ratio, I make these works of. So I get the model and then I make an investment of it and then that becomes a sculpture. Or, so if you fill it with bronze to see what it is, you ruin the artwork. And these are the lights that I make with my dad. This is a tattoo for a, a collector in Tokyo from a Tin Tin thing. It, I made it for something else and then he wanted it as a tattoo and I was like, okay then, I don't mind. And he, when I was in Tokyo, like, I don't know, maybe last year, he called me up and said he'd, he'd had it done and he wanted to show it me. So he booked a room in a hotel and he took me to this room in a hotel. And he took his top off and I was like, whoa. <laughs> And he got the tattoo in front of you, or did he have the No, he'd had it done. You can still see where the sticky tape had been from the dressing, so he took his, the cling film off in front of me. He was like, what do you think? Yeah, he'd never go in the spa again. Uh, and what about the, the relationship between what you do and, I mean, I know you, um, your work sometimes refers to architects or designers. Uh, one of the pieces in the exhibition here is based on um, 
the uh, architect Ernold Goldfinger. Um, do, do they, these types of, I mean, I guess he's not only an architect, a designer, he did a lot of other things. Um, are, are these types of figures um, influential for your practice? Yeah, I think I like appreciate designers more than artists because it's harder. I think it's harder to do. Like doing like a, a job where you advise for Nike is much harder than being an artist because there's parameters to it. Uh, an admin end user or a client of any kind or an identity that isn't your own is what, you know, you have to be way superiorly creative than, say, Rachel Whiteread to do that. That's like serious creativity. So it's weird because artists are always put at the top of the creative hierarchy. Well, that's nonsense, really. Because like Victor Papanek, who was a designer ecologist, or like Bruno Minari, were like massively more creative than any of, well, me or any of my peers, so anyone in the British Art Show, definitely. Apart from the designers, because there's loads of designers. Yes. Um, but that's my answer, not fact, that's just my opinion, so you don't. No one's, has anyone texted a question? <coughs> oh, not answering that one. Was there only one? I thought I heard your phone call a couple of times. I think there was people calling, but I'm not going to answer it because I'm going to have a talk. Um, I wanted to ask about um, your art education. Uh, that was the question. Oh, Did really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I know that you studied in Manchester as well as the Netherlands. Uh, and yeah, I applied to go to London to Goldsmiths and I didn't get in, didn't get an interview. And St. Martin's as well and I didn't get an interview. And then I went to Manchester, to Manchester Beckett University. <laughs> um, Not Polytechnic or Matt. I don't know. Um, I went there and I went there because the my foundation tutor was friends with the course leader and I hadn't got in anywhere. So he came around and said, go on then, you can call. It wasn't like you, you cast clearing or anything, it was just like a favour because I hadn't got in anywhere. So I went there and was really bitter for about three years about all my friends who'd gone to London who were um, following in the quite literally, the, in a very real sense, the footsteps of important, significant historically significant artist and got really uh, madly bitter about it and then left, just worked a lot really. I was in with the cleaners and out with the cleaners because everyone else was in halls of residence like shopping and getting drunk and it's shopping and getting drunk is not really my bag. Uh, so I just made up a lot and then <coughs> Then I went to Ben Kay. Does anyone know Ben Kay? That's weird. So Ben is, uh, he's from Leeds and he's an artist. And his mum taught at the Leeds Beckett, which is the university that borrowed its name from Manchester Beckett. Mm -hmm. And his dad worked at the Leeds, on the foundation at Leeds College, was it? No. Uh, anyway, Ben was really clued up. He, came, he went here, here, not here at the museum, to your, you back it one. And then he went to Manchester, he transferred, and he's from Leeds, and he used to work in North Bar, and he went to Maastricht, he went all around Europe and did loads of research, went to Maastricht, the Van Eyck Academy, and I was mates with him, and I said, how was your research trip? And he said, I found the best one. I said, great, I'll go there. So I didn't have to go around looking. He, and he got in, and I went to visit him, and then I applied there, and I went there. And that's the place where you have access to fabricators in a big studio, or, or that's that more the, the right. Okay. The Jan van Eyck is like, like Will used to teach there at Jan van Eyck, and it's more like a, a not production, <coughs> but like research, uh, making publications and doing symposiums. And so I don't quite know what it's like now. I haven't been back for a while. And then I did a year and eleven months, and then I left before you, I got my qualification, which was a laureate which is a postgraduate certificate in the Netherlands. And I left because 
I knew that, because I'd done two years and that I'd been, they paid for it, the Dutch government, and I knew that I would have to go back to Chester and get a job again because I didn't have any money. So what I did was left the Amber Knight just before getting my, my certificate and then applied to the Rijks Academy in Amsterdam, which was the other one, and went there and said, I haven't got... I haven't passed, I haven't got the thing, so I can still apply. And they said, OK. And they, luckily, they let me. So I got four years instead of two years. And did either of the, did your art training in any way influence you to try to set up an art school? Uh, uh, everything in my life has, has contributed to it. And how is that progressing? Including teaching at Leeds Met and Sheffield Hallam and Manchester Met and all those brilliant northern colleges. So the idea is to set up a school in Suffolk? In Suffolk, yeah, which is very picturesque and twee and Tory. Uh, so it's not everyone's bag. So yeah, so the, but the building that we had is the, the picturesque we Tory council. They shouldn't do this on the internet. <laughs> uh, we don't have the building that we had, so we're doing something else. I'm doing something else. Do you have another number where people can text donations? For <laughs> so it was going to be with other people's money, and then I realised that that's a total pain in the arse because those people then want to know how it's going. <laughs> so you spend all your time telling them how it's going and what they've paid for. And then the artist who, the idea is just to give some good artists who'd have to go and get a job, a studio and somewhere to live and a bit of money so they can do six months on their own, uh, whoever they are or whether they've got a degree or not or however old or not artist, designer or writer or whatever. So that's like total openness and that's how I think good art schools work without rules. And as soon as you have people giving their money that don't have the same <coughs> lack of want of rules. It becomes like, you know when you sponsor the panda in Chester Zoo? And you give like five quid and you get to name him or something. It like that. That's not the, a they good way to do it. decide who the panda should mate with or something. All these little pandas. Um. So, so I need to work extra hard to make enough money to finish this other weird plan, which is like having another full-time job. So the idea behind having this phone number and your second phone, um, what? I don't know really. I'd like, Gilbert and George used to write their phone number in the corner of works, but that was because they didn't have a website. Uh, but it's not like a marketing tool. It's not really in that whole thing. It's more, I actually didn't consider what it would be, what the, the voicemails and conversations and texts and images would be. I just thought about the billboard. So the typeface of the billboard's based on uh, a typeface of many numbers that can be mixed up that we took from Mexican billboards, because I collect images of billboards from Poland that are empty and Mexico that have phone numbers on. You call the phone number to say that you want to rent the billboard. So it's not there, but it's like Mexican handwriting. And they're, they're good numbers because they're painted really close up and you can't get a distance because you're up a massive ladder. So you get this really weird, beautiful numbers. Um, and I like that. And I like the fact that it's going to be in Poland in a couple of weeks and then it's going to uh, Berlin. So it's, I just use this phone. It's actually a Nokia and it has a phone number written on the back. But I'm using this one because I'm sick of texting five, 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 wait, three, wait, two, two, wait, eight, the same more. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm using this one. But so what I'll have it essentially in two weeks, I'll have four phones and they'll all have different numbers written on the back. And then, so I imagine the billboard and then I imagined in four years a bucket full of burners for phones that have been used because I only carry the phone for the duration of the billboard's life. Um, and my real objective is to make a, a bucket full of phones with different numbers. Not just SIM cards. And I hadn't, not SIM cards, the actual phones are in it. And I hadn't considered what people would send me. And there's some 
Blake or you wrote that? So there's some bloke who or lady who wrote they sent me a picture of the billboard on the first day and then the next day they sent to me again and they've been sending it us every day. It's really nice. It must be by their house and they walk past it. <coughs> and then there's a, 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 a lady who's a vicar in Canterbury offered me a job teaching art history, which I don't know anything about, so I won't be able to do it. Um, and yeah, it's really good. I had some nice students from Peterborough who were on a school trip at the show and like four of them called me with really interesting questions. Sometimes it's pain in the arse <laughs> when it won't stop ringing <coughs> or in the night. And some people want advice. There was a really nice one which was someone said, how do I get more exposure in the art? Um, oh, I've got to find it because the wording was brilliant. Uh, I think, yeah, you said how do I get more exposure? In I can't seem to get the right exposure for my work. Double meaning exposure, yeah? And I wrote overexposed 1.3 stops and it'll show up good in the selection procedure. All good, question mark, thanks, I was underexposing for way too long. It's good, isn't it? So I get all these like extra... It's like self, self-fulfilling prophecy because it's creating new works accidentally. So do, did anybody else send you questions? <coughs> Someone said, how do they get into the art school or something? <coughs> uh, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't got the money to finish it yet, so I won't get too excited. We mortgage the house and everything. Uh, should artists have a quota? Should have you have to apply to become an artist? Mean, meaning, <coughs> should there be a quota on the number of artists in the world, or is that...? That's interesting, I never thought that. Um, there, was this, there was a time in the Netherlands where it was so overfunded, art, we'd start stipendiums and work verses and things, that you'd have uh, people sitting outside Central Station playing <coughs> didgeridoo, and they'd be on 30 grand a year because they thought they were an artist. So. There is dangers, isn't there? I don't know, I just think it's a really big filter. Oh, you know, everyone moans, of, there's a lot of moaning about, I don't live in London, and I, and I don't, uh, I didn't go to the right college, and uh, it's not fair, because this person, I don't know, well, a lot, you know, I hear a lot of that, a lot, and it doesn't really mean anything. Because if you're into Formula One racing, you go to see Formula One racing a lot because you love it, and you'd hang out with mechanics and in body shops because you'd love the cars and you'd read about it all the time passionately and you wouldn't do anything else. And it's just just the way it is that the people who carry on making art are the ones that can't stop making art, that they want to do it. And there's people that want to be artists, and there's people who don't want to be artists, they just are artists, they can't, they don't say they're artists, they just make art all the time. Do you know what I mean? Does that make any sense? <coughs> it's not like there's a quota or you don't become an artist, you just make work. Like I saw a lot of students today, and I'd say the biggest a criticism or like doubt I had was why the last work they made was like three weeks ago. Because I haven't got anything to do, like part time job. If you have kids and run a business and have two other jobs and you still manage to make art, and... do you know what I mean? Oh, you got to go on negative at the end there, wasn't you? <laughs> <laughs> so, um... Maybe we should take a few questions now. Somebody wants to ask a question in person. Can I introduce Fatima? Sure. Do you want to introduce Fatima? So then sure. um, sitting next here in the front row um, is our friend Fatima. She's a wax ex photo figure and she's going to be attending various lectures um, that are part of the um, British Art Show. Um, so you might see her in the audience again. Um, as an ex voto wax figure, I think in part because the wax is quite impressionable, she's soaking up a lot of knowledge from the room. 
Um, Still some melt in a bit, I think. Yeah, and hopefully it's not too hot for her here. Um, but she, normally, um, she'll be sitting on a plinth in a gallery actually right next to Ryan's work. Um, She's a work by the collective Abake, uh, who is first in the catalogue, which you can buy for eighteen ninety nine tomorrow from the bookshop. Is that right? Maybe it's only sixteen. Only sixteen ninety nine from the bookshop. That's what she looks like, and she's just there. Uh, well, that's like this is like a early maquette of her, I think. Yeah, looks before she had any structure, she wasn't able to sit in a chair before. She's a bit like the. B A S A mascot hashtag hashtag B A S A mascot hashtag. She get her Instagram account. And if anyone has anything that they want to impart to her and would like to say to Fatima, to Ryan, to Fatima's quiet though. <laughs> No questions? I've got one, if no yes. one else has. I'm just curious about the motivation for the art school, in terms of, is it in response to <coughs> your experience, maybe a lack of something within your art school experience? There's loads of reasons. First one is that there is um, a discrepancy between uh, demographic of where people are from and opportunity in the art world, that's obvious, and in like dance and theatre and stuff, which is annoying. But then saying that, it's, I guess if you just work really hard and you just really, 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 really stick at it and you're good, you'd be alright anyway, but still, I, I do see loads of tough kids who get to do stuff that they definitely, definitely, I wouldn't have got definitely being at Manchester Metropolitan and only seeing shows in books and magazines and not in real. But then again, you know, it's like, I mean, eventually I went to live in London because, yeah, because I really <coughs> like art and there's loads of art in London. When I could afford it, I went straight there because then you'd see more, do more. Which would be like going to uh, York if you like cathedrals. <laughs> or, do you know what I mean? You wouldn't live in Birmingham if you like sea fishing because it's a long drive. That's what I'm getting at. Does that make any sense? Um, and then the other, the other, so there's that. There's a sort of money thing, an opportunity thing. But then also, I just, meet a lot of good artists that could do with a bit more time without having to deal... I mean, universities aren't the best places to make art, let's face it. But, I mean, art <coughs> education... Best art education is just having a warm room and a few friends around you and not having to have a job. But that can just go on for ages and people play Xbox, so you've got to draw the line somewhere. And then the other thing is, I live in Suffolk and I don't want to live in London because it's not nice. I just had to live in London because I'm a job. And loads of people come to visit, but it'd also be good to have some other people about. So where my studio is, there's people that work with me, but it'd be nice to have some other artists to have lunch with and fight, be jealous of and competitive with and have good conversations with us, eat dinner with. So, if I can, if I, yeah, <coughs> if I can give a few people a studio and have lunch with them, that's nice too. <coughs> Got no copy of my messages. Why is design more of a passion? Was it your course that helped you decide clear <coughs> your mind? Mine's not clear, it's really fuzzy. And, um, Oh, question, isn't it? Well, there's two from the same person. You mentioned how artists keep making art. Will you keep going? Yeah, get, well, I don't know anything else to do, really. Uh, this is like a weird way of doing questions at the end, isn't it? It's just me talking. <laughs> right, who's phone number 07598490385?
Should we call the number Bottle and there. see who it is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, should we call them? Yeah. Everyone's like, do the yeah. Silence, <laughs> silence. Silent. Uh, do your kids want to become artists like you or engineers like your dad? This is really, I feel like I'm on Saturday morning TV. <laughs> <laughs> Swap shop or like going live or something. Gordon the Gator, like that. Uh, don't know, because they're at six. I think she wants to ride a pony. <laughs> I'm doing a show with uh, Olive, my eldest, who's six, in, in a, next month in Torino, in Turin. And the place that I'm doing the show at, usually the artist they invite to use is a deceased artist and then they borrow work from the estate of the deceased artist and you make work to go with this work of this, your dead hero. And I said, can I make a show with my daughter instead because she keeps saying about doing an exhibition. And she's pretty good for a six-year-old. She's not drawing like rainbows, you know what I mean? She's doing quite interesting stuff. Uh, not that it should be encouraged. And... The woman said, yeah, she's got a six-year-old, she'd like to do that. So me and Ollie started making these works together and I made two or three works, she made two or three works, and then we made two or three works together. And then the woman at the, the place, the gallery, said, how do I price Ollie's works? And I was like, shit, you can't like put my prices because she's six. So I was trying to find a nice logic to price her works and I thought, maybe you could divide it by the amount of months younger than me or something like that like a really good economic strategy and she basically wants to she I, when you when i asked her what she wanted she wants a pony so she just wants to make enough from her wants, art sales so to get a pony and it doesn't say like euros and then it's a price it just says like work b pony <laughs> <laughs> f is seven diamantes and like seven flowers a week for a year or something Nice price and structure. Who has to follow that through? Hey? Who has to follow that through? I have to. The pony. I, have well, to the, the, ponies the pony's alright, it's just most of the cost of the pony's looking after it, isn't it? <laughs> so I'm going to have to write a little uh, thing, Sorry, no. caption in there that says it's the hay bales as well. <laughs> and the shed and the field and the saddles and the brushes and the, all that. your collection of words and photos for ideas and things. So I find a lot of the time I write notes, go back to my book with the notes, don't know what I was talking about and do you have a struggle with that one? It just changes, isn't it? It's changed because in the meantime you've learned other stuff <coughs> yeah. and you've added the stimuli. It doesn't matter that it's not the same thing, I think. It might become better with age. Like wine, not all wine. So you think you should take more down from the walls? Uh, to, to be totally honest, they're all down at the moment. There's no ideas up whatsoever. Why? Because um, we had to do a photo shoot. <laughs> and then it's, it's funny, the studio looks way bigger when there's ideas on the wall because you get a depth because of the text. It's very strange. I'm taking all down, it's tiny. Um, and also, I don't need to make any work because I'm skint. I can't make any new work because I don't want any money. So, it's better that they're not up there saying, make me, me. chastising me. I can only make things with cardboard for the moment until Christmas. Mad cats. Yes. You mentioned how um, you like to work together with your father. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether it, your studio reflects how a uh, like, like, like family environment or whether it's just more, more you as an individual and how that affects the way you work. Uh, I say we too much and it gets really confusing. And people don't know that. So if I'm here and working with someone who doesn't know that I'm the artist, and I keep saying we, because me and Freeman are here, then they think that we're collaborative, which is a bit weird. We eat lunch together. I mean, essentially, it's just like a company. There's Phil's the director, and I'm the creative director, and he runs the company, and I have the ideas. And then there's other people that do other jobs. Um, but it's not like 
a family. We're really good friends. And we, yeah, don't know. As a managing director of a city, we can't do that because it'll bankrupt us. Yes, that's why he's employed. <laughs> so I don't, yeah. Definitely. Or does he ever say, let's do this because... Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I wouldn't be making art if I didn't have someone to do that, because mm -hmm. I would have just gone mad. Is he like an editor or something? <coughs> he's not an editor. Mm -hmm. I've got an editor, mm -hmm. but he's not the editor. He's he's just he knows a lot about the work that I make, and he knows about the way I think, and he has the same morals and ethics as me, and he yeah runs the company and makes sure. We all get paid. Any more questions? <coughs> Do you see it a bit like a factory or not really? Not at all. No. <laughs> I see it like, um, do you remember Why Don't You? No. Are you all too young to remember Why Don't You? <coughs> Why Don't You was a kids programme that was the presenters were kids. So there wasn't any adults on it, and they were in a house. And I always wondered where the mum and dads were. <coughs> and they'd go, it was a magazine type programme, so there'd be features at different places in the house, and they'd go to it, and they'd always start by saying, why don't you open a lemonade stall on your street? Very pre-internet. Why don't you switch off your television? That's what they said. something that's boring instead. It was, yeah, and you're watching the telly, the irony of that. <laughs> But it was really good. It was like, you know, you'd make wigwams in your garden and stuff like that. Grow vegetables. It's probably a hangover from like 70s knee jerk to Thatcher or something. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. Right. Yeah. If you can't make any work because you're just getting. Why? Why are your production values so high? Why is your work so costly? To make or to buy. <coughs> to make. It's not. Loads of it's cheap. So the things that I'm showing here are really cheap. Yeah. Yeah. So I can print wallpapers. I just can't make any... <coughs> I just can't uh, fabricate stuff that... You know some works people pay for before you get them, like public commissions? And I can do those, I just can't do anything off my own back because I've spent a lot of money on a building. <coughs> but that's alright. It's like a. Well, you're, that's not really a business decision in the same way that other things might be. How do you mean? This is like economics, not art, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, you're probably not making those same kind of, Like, Phil doesn't get involved in that decision, does he? Of what buying the building? Yeah. Or? Um, I run it, yeah, I run it by it and we talked about it a lot because, yeah, because the art world's quite fickle and you don't know when you're getting paid and things can go like this, like, really, like, unbelievably. So you have to just be a bit careful. But there's also a massive um, myth about rich artists. It's not true, there's only four rich artists <coughs> and all the others have like middle band of income and then lower and that's it. It's not like there's loads and loads so of billionaires. It's billion just like the 1%. Less than 1%, yeah. definitely. It's just that they're written about a lot and people talk about it and then it's exaggerated. It, it, it doesn't really exist, there's just a few of them. Some of the biggest artists that you know, have, I know, don't have any money. So it's not. Like, you don't do it for that, do you? you do it because it's, cause it's a buzz, isn't it? <laughs> Maybe that's a nice way to end. It's a buzz, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you.